Who here has got the hunger? Huh? I said, who here has got the hunger? Who's got a bursting need, an unsettled expectation, a raging doubt hollowing the stomach? How are we going to fill the holes within our souls, people? With Doritos, of course. <laughs> there is an aisle in every deli, bodega, and grocery store, and an oasis in every food desert filled with little bits of gold, abundant as air, glossy, bag, and crunchy. In the beginning, when snacks were formless and desolate, God created the corn supplier. <laughs> the corn supplier dried and preserved his corn in exact measurements and temperatures, kept his livelihood silo, sun bright yellow and fructose. Then God created the Pepsi Company, who took that formlessness and turned that desolation pyramid and that pyramid has been filled and is currently overflowing into our roadways. One eye defined shining green gold nutrition. Oh, but that's not it. God is a good writer. Then God created third quarter drops in revenue. And then he created marketing and somewhere in between licking the cool ranch off of his fingertip, and the toilet, God created poetry. <laughs> I said, how are we gonna sell the poetry, people? Tell me how we're gonna sell the poems. You know the answer. Say it to me now. Doritos, Doritos, Doritos. A poem for every Dorito, a Dorito on every poem. This is the dream. It is a triangle of hybrid vegetable covered in powdered poem, pulverized, hydrogenated, 45 second corn oil frying covered in cheese seasoning that contains absolutely no cheese. <laughs> No, now, now I know what you're thinking. You're saying to yourself, but isn't that selling out? <laughs> but I say God invented the sellout in an effort to highlight the underdog and a purer thing of poetry never existed quite like the Dorito. Putting your poems on a bag of chips with a made-up Mexican name on it isn't selling out. It's buying in. Self-investment never tasted so delicious. Besides, we've already sold out. Every single last one of us, we just spend our lives trying to figure out for how much. It's as good an as an idea as any and we gotta sell these Doritos somehow, people. <laughs> I, wore, I wore this uncomfortable suit just for that poem. Uh, it works. It works. Um, so the rest are gonna be... Hallelujah. Hallelujah, yes. Uh, all the rest of the poems are gonna be pretty much depressing, so order another drink. It'll make things better. Um, okay. Um, this is about the media, I think. That's depressing. Yeah, it's pretty depressing, right? Right there. Your French was beautiful. Uh, I cut my belly open because I thought the television network would fill me with gold. Instead, they gave me a needle and thread, a mop and bucket, and said, Clean this shit up. I used my hair to soak up the blood because I saw a guy do that in a YouTube video once. And let me tell you, it takes a long time to soak up the reddest part of your insides with the most flowing part of your outside. The next day, I snuck, into the mor I snuck onto the morning news and cut my belly open once more. 
The night before when I did it the first time, it was the grave ship, so nobody was watching television. But early morning America likes my guts, so the producer apologized and offered me a segment the next morning. Unfortunately, I never reeled my innards back into my stomach, and I think a janitor threw them into a dumpster. So the next morning, when I sliced my belly open a third time, nothing came out, and I was put on the newscaster's desk from then on. A few weeks later, I received a letter from a viewer that read, Dear Newscaster, Why is there so much big band, booming bass, horn blowing and smooth piano rolling going on during this murder? Do people really go out and buy a Toyota after seeing other people get murdered on the news? Justice is really cute, like an old drunk looking surprised into a brown paper bag that has a bottle in it. Cute like a chokehold. Cute like a loose cigarette. Cute like boys in blue tight uniforms and disco blue and red badges. Cute like those news trucks of yours that go erect at sites of tragedy and quit before anybody comes to change things as usual, to attempt to change business as usual. Why do the lights and camera leave once the spectacle has reached saturation? Love, the viewer. After reading the letter, I left the news station and tried to soak up other people's blood with my hair and realized that that doesn't really work. So I asked the rag company for a donation to begin to help clean up this mess, and they said no. Life is cute like this sometimes. A whole lot of blood with very little thinking and limitless ways to absorb it, hidden behind an endless wall of excuses. Wow. Last <laughs> time. Is that it? Seven minutes. Beautiful. All right. Uh, I made a chat book that I don't have copies of, so you can't buy it unless you want to buy this one. Uh, cool. I'm a terrible salesman, although I look like a good one. <laughs> All right. Uh, so uh, I'm the first person in my f immediate nuclear family to be born in America. Yo. Uh, this is kind of about that. Nothing is more important to a Russian than his coat, <coughs> except maybe vodka. <laughs> My grandfather kept his bald head warm as a furrier. That's also he, how he kept my mother warm at age six when her mother passed away. My family keeps spirits alive with a lit candle in the windowsill, a shot glass at the table, and every winter they air out my grandfather's spirit by throwing their fur coats out on the snow in the front yard. Coats that they've had for decades. Coats that held them before they held me in the afterbirth. Coats that took so long to create and buy that it makes those stereotypical Soviet lines for toilet paper look like amusement park rides. I don't have a fur coat. I haven't earned it yet, haven't been through enough anguish to feel cold enough to deserve one. For now, I have wool and friendship to keep me warm during the one random April snow that always shows up to kiss the green flowers with a bit of frost as if to say, remember me. But I'll keep this candle lit and, this, and I'll keep this glass filled clear to the brim with vodka till I can free my family spirit on our green American lawn. Beautiful. Read shit. You guys have read Bukowski, right? That's a stupid question, right? Yeah, whatever. I'm, an I'm that asshole who asked that question. Uh, um, okay, this is a poem called Fondling Your Bukowski. <laughs> and that, that helps you fondling your Bukowski. I couldn't help myself once I walked into the one room apartment. She had all these books above her bed in a bookcase fused to a headboard. 
Any woman who sleeps with books above her head is crazy and sexy. John Waters suggested that we need to make reading sexy. He said, if you go home with somebody and they don't have books, then don't fuck them. <laughs> I saw the book Women sitting there and grabbed for it. And as, as my finger laid upon the spine, she yelled, stop! I turned my head and said, what? You're fondling my Bukowski, she whispered. <laughs> Smile turned to laughter, turned to kiss, turned to 3 a.m. And the sun rose sometime afterward while we slept. <laughs> Yay! Can I have like four minutes? All right, let's see if I can blast these two out of the world. Uh, okay, uh... Being a first-generation American in my family meant that I got my ass kicked in my house like I was still in Russia because that's how they took, that's how discipline went down. So this is getting this is getting my ass kicked by my mom. It's called "I Wish the Tornado Remembered." Give me a memory so that the past can have a moment in my gift, my life is a precious mineral harnessed to a hiding rock inside a dynamited cave. The first time I hardened, it was a regular old beating over poor school grades. I went hurricane around the dining room table while mom tornadoed behind me, dropping chairs down on the Clorox floor to make the next round just a little bit more obstacle. I jumped, I wailed, I cried for the storm to stop. What does it mean when a tornado rages through a child that never got to be built? Cornered in my room, fatigued and eyes rolling, I lost control of my body and panicked, grabbed for a blanket, and rolled myself up in a mumble of gasp and fidget. Pressure, pressure, pressure. I turned into a diamond, and that's when she stopped being a storm, ran to my lightning body, loud with mental thunder, and hugged my poor head, whispered into it that she's never going to rip through here again. Wow. All right. Two minutes. Two minutes. Two minutes. All right, this should fit in. I'll get it. It'll be two minutes. Okay. Rip it. The disconnect between immigrants and their children <clears throat> starts at language. Perception spark to thought create, sent to speech center, and uttered out the mouth. Russian mom and dad like to speak in Russian, and Russian son responds in English. <laughs> Russian mom and dad are like, don't ask about the past because we came here for your future. Russian mom and dad like big houses and big success, no matter the size of regret. Blood is often confused with history, that the acts within the past somehow define us this very moment here between us. Russian mom and dad like watching same shows in same house, but in different rooms. Russian mom and dad like to give advice to Russian son. You should eat this borscht. You should sit at this table. You could work in a bank. Marry a nice Jewish girl. Have beautiful blue-eyed babies. Russian mom and dad like to give... Russian mom and dad like to turn advice into conversations about food and furniture. <laughs> Blood is often chained to identity, but what happens when where you come from feels just as much a fallacy as where you are? When the disconnect feels like judgment and disgrace? I shake when I'm trying to figure out who I am, when I pick up photos of their past, when I look out the windows at suburbia, Russian mom and dad like when Russian son fails. They write when this happens. I shake when I'm in one of the rooms between Russian mom and dad, when the distance is root deep, black hole wide, and the language is getting stranger and stranger. Russian mom and dad don't want to let, 
Russian mom and dad don't want to let one another know that they are crying in their rooms. Russian mom and dad like to think that Russian son don't know what love is. And Russian son is like, I wish I could have lived with you through the pain so I can see Russian mom and dad perspective, respective, reflective, feels like Russian mom and dad meant to use a contraceptive, but didn't. I shake when I figure out that wanting something is so much more powerful than needing it. And dependence on blood will always lead to sadness, to pain. And desire for connection will bring the fallen ancestors back from the past to walk with you shoulder to shoulder. Russian son wants more than this air in this lung for Russian mom and dad to understand him in any language. Wow.